Hello everybody. You are watching Eddie's English Literature. I am Ardhindu De. Today we are discussing emotional complexity of William Shakespeare's Hamlet and the intricacy of the plot design that we find in Shakespeare's beautiful drama Hamlet. Along with Hamlet's personality, we will try to gauge the very matrix by which Hamlet's character has been drawn and how far we can read Hamlet in different lights, in different sets of interpretations. But first of all, what is tragedy? The term tragedy or tragic drama is broadly applied especially to literary and, and to the dramatic representations of a kind of serious action which eventuate in a disastrous conclusion for the protagonist that is uh, the chief character uh, in the play meets some tragic end. It uh, obviously rouses a kind of pity and fear. Most precise and detailed discussion on the term this tragic interpretation of pity and fear properly begins with but not to be concluded with that theorem that Aristotle propounded in classical analysis in his book Poetics. Aristotle based his theory on introduction from the only examples available to him. Obviously I am just mentioning the triumvirate Ascala, Sophocles and Euripides of that time. Uh, you can also read the proper explanation and definitions of tragic dramas in my other post that you will find in my description. Now, understanding Hamlet is a must because this is a classic piece. So when you are going to understand the very drama Hamlet, uh, the very character of Hamlet is itself an intense debate and as well as for critical study. Now, as a student, you are reading Hamlet. Hamlet being a, such a tragedy, we will reach out to its plot structure, uh, which uh, Aristotle defines the soul of tragedy. Shakespeare has a definite design of plot, def a definite dramaturgic skill that he has used. So we will definitely had the same purpose of alienating the character or uh, depicting the very character of Hamlet and how Shakespeare has been able to depict the character of Hamlet through his dramaturgic skills. We have the sole motive of understanding that. Hamlet opens at Elsinore castle in Denmark with the return of Prince Hamlet from the University of Wittenberg in Germany. Uh, he finds uh, that his father, the former king, has recently died and that his mother, Queen Gertrude, has subsequently married Claudius, his father's brother, his uncle. So Claudius uh, has assumed the title of King of Denmark and how his mother hastily married uh, that uncle. Hamlet's uh, obviously the sixth sense is something is rotten in the state of Denmark, is intensified when his friend and fellow student Horatio informs him that a ghost resembling his dead father has been on the uh, battlement of the castle. Hamlet later confronts that ghost uh, who tells him that Claudius, his uncle, in fact murdered Hamlet's father and makes uh, Hamlet infuriated by that particular notion of understanding and Hamlet swears to avenge the death of his father. Now, in order to disguise his feelings, Hamlet declares that from now on he will demonstrate an antique disposition, a kind of a madness. His behavior uh, appears to everyone but Claudius to be a form of madness. Now, from this point of time, uh, Hamlet expounds into in depth character study. Okay. Now, Hamlet's madness, the complexity of his personality uh, grows up and the complexity of the plot intensified and uh, the drama unfolds into a beautiful magic. Hamlet's emotional complexity or the very development of Hamlet's personality that we find in Shakespearean drama 
uh, is of intense debate and understanding. Now ever since uh, the defining term of how the plot should be, Aristotle's uh, poetics sets forth a kind of a perfect design. Many dramas have been written artistically effective and serious plots ending that kind of a catastrophe uh, which Aristotle says pity and fear. So this has been tried. But uh, the tragedies of Shakespeare or the like of Elizabethan dramatists like that Marlowe, George Chapman, Webster, Sir Francis Beaumont and John Fletcher, these tried their best to conform the rules of Aristotelian norms or Aristotelian dictums of that time. But the tragedy of Hamlet, ever since it is being performed in the early 1600, uh, the role of William Shakespeare's Hamlet has uh, remained a favorite not only for the critics, not only for the actors, but for the common people. It simply draws or pulls the audience into that complexity of Hamlet's personality because that is the very soul of Hamlet drama. Now, nowhere in this complexity more apparent than in Hamlet's famous soliloquy in uh, Act 3, Scene 1. Throughout this soliloquy, which uh, happens at the very beginning of the act, uh, 3, Scene 1, uh, he thinks about whether he should face life's hardship head on or end them by time. So Hamlet's indecision is here a matter of discussion. Hamlet is alone on stage as he asks these questions about his purpose and life. Uh, I can't resist myself from reading this text to be or not to be that is the soliloquy to be or not to be that is the question whether it's nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them to die to sleep no more and by sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural songs. That place is here too. It is a consummation. Devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. Hey, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have suffered of this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor song, the proud man's consumely the pangs of despised love the laws delay the insolence of office and the spurns that patient merit of the honor detects when he himself might his point was make with a bare booking who would hard his beer to ground and sweat under a weary life. But that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no travelers return, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all and thus the native view of resolution is circled over with the pale cast of thought. And enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard their currents turn away and lose the name of action. This particular soliloquy 
by which we can straight head on to define Hamlet's mind. Uh, but uh, do you know what is soliloquy? The soliloquy is a monologue in which a character reveals inner thoughts, motivations and feelings. Shakespeare extensively used this technique, particularly his poetic and rich kind of imagery stuff soliloquies are in play into Hamlet in Macbeth or in King Lear. Uh, particularly in this Hamlet, a play that you all know about a man whose mind may be his fatal flaw, thus the soliloquy form reaches its highest level. Now this particular speech tells about his oscillation and vacillations, about the true extreme ends of his indecisions. He cannot take a decision whether he took revenge on his uncle or not. Now, this unique style of representing the mind through soliloquy is greatest here. Now, through this kind of soliloquies, Shakespeare reads the very mind of Hamlet. And we can, as an audience, enter into the domain of Hamlet's mind, into his soliloquies, into his telling of psyche, in telling of his mind's words. Now, while understanding Hamlet, you must pop up into those categories of soliloquies and try to decipher the very meaning of it. We are uh, talking about Hamlet's and its originality. We must say that uh, Shakespeare must venture into telling a story of Hamlet in his own way. Shakespeare took no trouble to be original. Now, however, it would be misleading to say that he has summed up uh, the old tradition. Okay, of him, we can say that T.S. Eliot, uh, as he tells, uh, the most individual part of work may be those in which the dead poets, the ancestors, assert their immortality vigorously. So, uh, in tradition and individual talent, uh, the T.S. Eliot version is that he is a great talented artist if he follows the classical features or the earliest um, dramatic styles and if he imbibes that spirit in his own writing. So Shakespeare is such a genius who has been spirited predecessors but he has the unique way of telling his story and there is the uh, genuinity, there is the greatest quality of Shakespeare. Now again if you uh, talk about American poet Walt Whitman's famous song of myself. You can read this long poem. Uh, it was written in 1881, most probably, which illustrates the author's perception of death in an, uh, as an integral part of living. Uh, spirit of death uh, to be accepted with a light, with much fun, as we are leading. The, the decisive end of life is death. It is not a crime. So why I am telling about Whitman's this particular poem is that that Shakespeare visualizes the concept of death or the fear of death or the subject matter of death in Hamlet's mind as it being interpreted through Hamlet's mind in Hamlet's working and that intensive design of understanding Hamlet through or the words of Hamlet's mind uh, that uh, Shakespeare is very close. Uh, to psychological interpretation. In Shakespeare's Hamlet, uh, whatever, or the projection of fear in Hamlet, that is the very ultimate of Hamlet's personality, is seen through a new light. And that new light is not, even though the lights or the shades or the colors are being drawn from ancient writers or pre predecessors of Shakespeare, but uh, perceiving it or projecting it in a new way uh, is entirely done by Shakespeare himself. It is quite evident that in writing Hamlet, uh, Shakespeare to some extent adopted the drama traditions of the Seneca tragedy, uh, which is also known as the Riven tragedy or the tragedy of blood. This type of play derived from uh, Seneca's favorite material of murder, revenge, ghost, mutilation and carnage. But while Seneca um, had uh, relegated such methods to long reports of offstage actions by messengers, Elizabethan dramatists usually represented offstage actions into onstage to satisfy the 
appetite of the contemporary audience for violence and horror. You must uh, understand the very prospect of Elizabethan audience. Most of them were illiterate. Now, Thomas Kidd's The Penis Tragedy established that popular jar in English and uh, its significant after effect uh, in its own time, most uh, famously in Shakespeare's Hamlet. A play they adopted the revenge play conventions and turned them inside out. Uh, Rebecca Bushnell's tragedy is short introduction. Uh, he mentions this particular line that Hamlet is a, uh, a revenge tragedy that questions every aspect and convention of the revenge tragedy plot while it uh, reproduced them. So why I am mentioning these references is that Shakespeare copied uh, the type of blood uh, from other Senecan style as well as from kids but his representations of horror uh, that he projects in this particular play uh, is through the Senecan motives of bloodshed, Senecan motives of violence and other things. But what is Shakespeare's um, genuine quality is representing Hamlet's mind. The Hamlet's mind is full of blood, is full of oscillations, full of fear, a kind of a psychotic, traumatic design of his mind is Shakespeare's own. And the horror, the pain, the black is inside of the Hamlet's mind instead of uh, the on-stage performances of the so many of the bloods. So you must understand that Hamlet's and its performance entirely depend upon projecting Hamlet's character and how Hamlet's inner character is being depicted on stage by words, by imagining is one of the greatest understanding possible. The play interrogates why revenge motivates a plot not by directly questioning the value of revenge but by deferring it hamlet uh, has raised the most important question for all those who are capable of inquiring into truth into life into existence the most important question of all question is what is true happiness is there a possibility to achieve it is it true happiness possible at all or is all momentary? Is life only a dream? Is there something substantial in it too? So brooding over that soliloquy part that I have mentioned in Act 3, Scene 1, as if in a roundabout way, that is the very center point of our discussion. One should start reading Hamlet. It is quite impossible to understand Hamlet in first, second or third reading. In fact, gradually as you progress, you will understand the very character of Hamlet in different stages of your life. As if taking or making an indecision is itself a decision and that Hamlet like us always face in our lifetime many times. For Shakespeare and his contemporaries, as much as for their ancient Greek and Roman predecessors, the very nature of tragedy seemed to require that it explored the sad stories of king or at least of men and women dignified by royal blood or civil authority. An exemplary dramatic fall, one which stirred the emotions of pity and fear in lesser mortals had to be a fall from the height of influence and honor. In fact, Shakespeare's all of the tragedies deal almost uh, ex exclusively uh, with the destinies of kings and princes, for um, whose fortune depends those of the nation, their rule. However, there is one difference. Unlike the Greek tragedies, which were the tragedies of fate, Shakespearean tragedy is to some extent a tragedy of character. Fate does play a very large and important part. It is preeminently a tragedy of character because in Shakespeare, character is destiny. The fault lies not in their stars but in men themselves. In all of the Shakespearean tragedies, we can trace the tragedy uh, to a 
certain fat leader or weakness or predispositions in the hero. He has in fact in him uh, something that offset all his virtue and brings about his downfall and death that is Hamarsia. In the case of the play um, Hamlet, there is no doubt that the tragedy uh, of the prince is due chiefly to a fault of his own character, the indecision. Uh, there is in him what may be called a kind of a, a tragic flaw. Hamlet is by nature a reflective type of man, uh, very much given to philosophic speculation. Uh, it is true as the proverb says that a man must think before uh, he acts but Hamlet only thinks, broods about many a things, thinks, thinks until and unless he loses all his capacity for action. In this particular logical explanation um, it can be true that Hamlet is a tragedy of reflection, Hamlet is a thinker. A speculative intellect who whose speculative intellect is tragically ineffective in this world of action where a man is just by what he does not by what he thinks really this is the pragmatic world this world is a world of hard and stern reality and a man filled with moral idealism is doomed to tragic failure in this sense Hamlet is a tragedy of moral idealism. German scholar, German critic Seligel has a fine remark in this. Now he finds that Hamlet is in fact in the labyrinth of thought. He cannot end what he begins. Life is for Hamlet a kind of a perfect complexity. There is duality in fact. The duality of happiness and unhappiness is the most fundamental and the most symptomatic. But there is, uh, there are a thousand and one dualities. The duality of love and hate, the duality of life and death, day and night, summer and winter, youth and old age and so on and so forth. But the fundamental duality, the duality that represents the man that represents all other dualities is that of happiness and unhappiness. Now Hamlet have action. Now before he take action, he thinks, will his action be or make him happy or unhappy? Now life knows nothing of unhappiness. It is pure happiness. It knows nothing of death. It is pure life. It knows nothing of darkness. It is pure light. To know it is the very goal. Now, in search of light, our life leads, but there is other half of life that is dark. Our life is almost a vicious circle. One mischief leads to another and continued, continued. Mischiefs grow out of mischiefs. Only mischiefs can grow out of mischiefs. And you go on living and moving in circle, you don't know what else to do. You do good, at least you think you are doing good, but the good never happens. Otherwise, the world would have been overflowing with good. So, everything is not under our control. The happiness or unhappiness is the matrix of the world living. Even though we deny death, life has the ultimate truth of death. So, Hamlet has a kind of philosophical thinking and he broods over that thought again and again. And his thinking is a matured one. But he delayed the action. Now another key feature I like to highlight uh, that uh, you have to find out conflict in Shakespearean tragedy particularly this Hamlet. The conflict between fate and free will that you will find in ancient literature. At the heart of every um, tragedy, in fact, lies a universal struggle between the human inclination to accept the fate absolutely and the natural desire to control destiny. Uh, in in so Buckley's writing, in Shakespeare's writing, both agree that uh, force of destiny and choice have the power that control human life. But these great rights 
uh, espouses a perspective on the struggle born on a specific time and culture. For the Greek Sophocles, fate for what powers human will, Sophocles' characters ultimately surrenders after resistance, recognizes and reversal to their destinies. But for Shakespeare, a Christian, the choice between good and evil represents man's basic dilemma. For him, the human will is indomitable. The fate may ultimately win, a man must fight to the death. If necessary, in order to um, remain the master of his own self, master of his own choices. Uh, while you are reading Hamlet, you must take in reference that Sophocles race or Sophocles Oedipus story. Like uh, Oedipus, Hamlet also begins with the death of a king. In Oedipus and Hamlet, we might think at first as the heroes do. Present crisis could be resolved if you could find the murderer and then revenge the death of the king. However, that is exactly not the case and the drama continued. While Hamlet knows that his world is out of joint or rotten, he does not even know at first that his own uncle is the very murderer. Even he did not know that his own father has been murdered. He knows uh, that his father is dead and his mother has married his uncle. The twist in the play comes early on when the ghost tells him who killed his father. That the truth that is the climax for Oedipus is the very beginning of a frustrated plot of revenge for tragedy. So what is climax in Oedipus is in fact the very uh, beginning of that is the very change in the subject. This particular lecture will lead you into the study of Hamlet. Instead of properly understanding Hamlet, you will beforehand get some knowledge hither and thither to make a very fair beginning of the play of the Hamlet. In, into my other series of defining the drama, or sections of definition of dramas and the type of Shakespeare and tragedies and line by line reading of Hamlet and Macbeth and other tragedies. I will just recommend to you to go to this lecture of mine once again so that you can get a glimpse of Hamlet first and then venture into the text. So like, share, comment and obviously subscribe to my channel to get this kind of post. Bye bye.